And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, the whole area of, of evangelism and discipleship is really a huge area for the church. And I think that what we need to do, and rather than trying to come up with these canned ideas and canned programs of getting people to somehow reach out to their neighbors, is that we have to actually create a culture uh, in our churches for evangelism, for discipleship. And discipleship is the key. But again, I think we always come down to this whole idea that we think we can mass produce disciples or we think we can mass produce leaders, which we can't. That's not what we see. We don't see Jesus modeling discipleship in that manner. We don't see it in the book of Acts, that that's not the manner in which the church moved forward. When we look at the first century church, they turned the world upside down in one generation, which is astounding. And it was, an, it was a hostile environment. And uh, the way they did that was through relationship, uh, through modeling, through mentoring, through training the few. Other interesting thing that I've noticed lately is when you study the Gospels, and even in, when you study the book of Acts, is that um, the majority of Jesus' ministry was to people who were invisible people. Uh, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the elite, it wasn't the, the rich, it wasn't the, the leadership of, of Israel. It was basically people who other people overlooked. For example, a woman at the well, she was invisible. She was uh, rejected from her own village. The disciples didn't even see her. She was a Samaritan. She was a woman. Um, they didn't give her the time of day. And yet Jesus began to reach out to her. And before he was all done, not only did she come to Christ, but the whole village came to Christ. Um, in the book of Acts, lay at the gate. He was invisible. People walked by him for 40 years to the temple. Every day they went to the temple, they walked right by that guy. Never saw him until one day, uh, Peter and John being sensitive to the Holy Spirit saw him. It's interesting if you go back to the woman at the well, that we often will quote Jesus when he says, you know, don't say the harvest is not ready for three or four months, but the harvest is white right now. But the context of that was the woman at the well because the disciples didn't see her and Jesus is trying to get their attention. He's really saying to the disciples, look at the harvest is white. I want to say that we look at Canada and we look at our rural areas and we think, well, you know, it's, this is a hard place and it's hard to preach the gospel now and it's hard to make disciples. That's, we would say that in an urban setting or in a rural setting. But I, I believe that's a total fallacy. I believe the harvest is all around us. Our problem is, as believers, we don't see the harvest. And so I, I think that's the major one of the major problems that we need to address is actually teaching and training our people to see the harvest. Well, the Bible says without a vision, the people perish or they don't know what to do. And uh, we find that that is uh, true in, in, in church a lot of times. People don't know what to do, uh, but the Great Commission is still standing for the church. Matthew 28 says, go into all the world and make disciples. And uh, so we're, we're spending our lives trying to not just evangelize and win souls, but to make disciples, disciplined followers of Jesus, uh, who can then take that vision and run with it into our culture. Well, vision, vision leads everything that we do. Um, when we're deciding what we have to do, we have to decide what we want to accomplish first. What's the vision from which it's coming? And so vision leads us. And, and, and vision sometimes changes a little bit. The, the core vision stays the same. You know, Jesus, he, he came for souls, he died for souls, and he's coming back for the church. And, and so the church is central in that. And, uh, but the vision of the local church sometimes transitions, or even the vision in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the church needs to be passionate about yeah. souls. So Jesus is still passionate about souls. He's coming back for souls. Yeah and uh, we need to be yeah. contending for souls. But even as we fight for souls, we've been always aware that there's such a spiritual battle to be fought in order to reach those souls. And uh, the Bible says that it's the, manif the manifold wisdom of God is gonna be made known by the church to powers and principalities. And so we know that as the church stands up and does what it's supposed to do, uh, that there is uh, advancement made in the spiritual realm too. And that makes way for mm -hmm. people to be able to even comprehend the Lord because, you know, it's the move of the Spirit of God that will open up uh, eyes and hearts to comprehend, understand, and see. And it's hard sometimes, you know, they uh, are, we get 
program oriented in our in our thinking as leaders in the church and you run a program run a program it's hard to kill a program but if the program isn't fulfilling the vision if the program isn't reaching people for Jesus it's not maturing them or mm -hmm. equipping them and releasing them into ministry you're wasting your yeah. time you know there's yeah. a lot of good things to do uh, in the world but what is the vision God has called you to do and if you want the, the people to be burning brightly and enthused, um, they, they need to know what the vision is because it, vision fuels it. Vision is what makes you wake up in the morning and want to get out of bed and do something. And so the church needs to know what it is that they have to do. And it's more practical and simple than we think that we we just need to serve him. And every once in a while, my wife will say, tell me, why are we doing this again? You know, and we'll have to relive and reignite <laughs> that vision because you can get ground down with the day-to-day -day grind of just life and paying the bills and going to work and coming back. And, and we're called to a higher purpose. This is not our home. We're ambassadors for Jesus. Mm -hmm. We come with the authority, the responsibility, the vision, uh, the drive, the, the, the kingdom of God principles. And that's coming in the name of Jesus. And so uh, you have to carry that vision. And uh, if you're going to be a effective uh, reaching people for Jesus. Vision. According to eHealth Sask, the average number of alcohol-related deaths between 2010 and 2016 was 103. For deaths related to drug overdose, it was 92. And for suicides in Saskatchewan, it was 136. And these numbers are expected to continue rising my generation needs hope, and hope is only in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says that today is the day of salvation. And Luke 14 verse 23 says to compel them to come in. No one is guaranteed another day, so we need to be living our lives as examples of Jesus. So let me ask you this, is your life compelling enough to point people to Jesus? As my career's gone into the, the political realm, I found that it's very important to focus on, on that prayer as well. Uh, you know, from a, a personal support, I think it's, uh, you know, some people think of it more as a meditation. I think that may be part of it, but it's so effective when you talk to the Father, the Father of creation and, and uh, our Lord Jesus Christ about these things. And I truly believe in this time, I mean, uh, you know, Ephesians 6 really speaks to me quite a bit, whether it's focusing on, on uh, you know, the armor of God and how in this day that we see so many crazy things happening in the world that people don't understand. I think if we actually focus on God's word and pray about it, uh, he really does give us direction. Some of these things start making sense. So we realize that, you know, it's all about good and evil, powers and principalities. And if we truly pray to God and ask him for the strength and guidance through the, you know, using the armor of God and, and the examples that Christ left us when he was here uh, through prayer, it really does, uh, I think, help one in some difficult situations in a difficult job. And, uh, you know, I really encourage people to, to do that, to not only pray for themselves, to pray for others. The Word of God is powerful. You know, I, I tend to focus on the Bible a lot, pray through the Bible, uh, read it every morning. And, and when you bring that to the Lord in prayer and ask him to maybe clarify some of the things that you don't understand, you know, how much that uh, his Word can really speak to us and guide us as well. In my duties here in the legislature, uh, I've, it's, it's strange how it's happened. Not strange, I know how it's happened. It's all God's work, but uh, focused on a, a prayer group, uh, a group of uh, individuals that, that would meet in, uh, in an office or my office, uh, usually Wednesday mornings early at seven o'clock. And to see the group of people that have assembled uh, basing our, our relationship on, on realizing the different realms of influence we have, where we come from in society, but also the different uh, perspectives that we have and also all being uh, you know, men and women of prayer and sitting in my office and talking about what's going on in our lives, what's going on in the world and then bringing it to, to the Lord in prayer and praying for people that don't know him as well, how it, it gives us direction, it gives us a real direction to answer uh, you know, some of the questions we have again, but also to, uh, to direct us in praying for our communities, our realms of influence, whether it's politics, whether it's a church, whether it's business, whether it's education, whether it's first responders, policing, you know, whether it's our city, our province, or our country, not only for, for leaders and people, but also for people to come to know Christ and to know God, because uh, there's so much going on in the world now with the new age mentality and, and different um, beliefs that uh, people, I think, are getting directed in some really strange ways that, um, you know, I'm just praying for people to be open, have their houses and their hearts open to, to God and His Word, pick up the Bible and read it, ask God to, to give them direction, 
and pray for God to give them direction uh, in his word and uh, to really work on their hearts. And I found quite often that if you challenge, not so much challenge God, but ask him for that guidance, how many people will be impacted and actually come to a relationship with Christ. I've had the joy of um, ministering in Saskatchewan since 1970 and watching the ups and downs of, of the province. But it's been exciting to see the prophetic word of the Lord that has come over Saskatchewan. People who didn't know a thing about Saskatchewan prophesied great things. Actually, the prophetic has created a, a move of God here. And I believe in 1948, God moved. There was like a, a sheet of blessing that God wanted to bring on Saskatchewan. We're seeing that today. We're seeing it actually happen right now. Where there's unity uh, amongst the, the different churches and denominations, God is commanding his blessing in this place and souls being saved. I just believe very strongly that this is a, an epicenter of something that God is doing. And he is going to, again, distribute people from this place to many places. There's going to be rising up with humility, a rising up of people and movements of God. In fact, I, I believe it won't be denomination as much. It'll be heart to heart, not head to head, but heart to heart, a relationship uh, I love uh, Psalms where it says, and there is a river of God whose streams make glad the house of the Lord. It's the streams coming together, God moving in Saskatchewan and then moving out of Saskatchewan and simply going to touch so many people actually across the world. So now we're raising up and sending out many, many qualified people filled with the Holy Spirit that are not afraid, not ashamed of the gospel, reaching out to souls. And we're believing not just for a few people, Christ didn't die on the cross to lose the world. He died on the cross to save the world. And we're believing for that in Jesus name, amen. Well, I'm Alan Osoup, my wife, Carol. Right now we're doing a cross Canada tent revival tour and we're targeting all First Nations reservations across the country. We started in BC and we'll end in Labrador. And the Holy Spirit is really moving amongst our people. Who well, the scripture says in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he said that our young men shall see visions and our old men shall dream dreams and even upon my handmaidens, he said, in those days will I pour out my spirit. And he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we really trust in the working of the Holy Spirit that he's working with us and he's, he's uh, saving our people and he's delivering them and people are getting healed through the power of the spirit of the living God. The scripture says no man can be saved unless the spirit of God draws him. And that's what's taking place all across the country right now amongst our Indian people and reservations that God is pouring out his spirit and God is drawing the people by his spirit. And the scripture says it shall come to pass that every yoke shall be destroyed and every burden shall be lifted because of the anointing. And that's what's really setting our people free right now. It's the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Then you should be witnesses 
He said in Jerusalem and Judea and even the very uttermost parts of the earth, the Holy Spirit is moving in such a powerful way that people are becoming aware of salvation like never before. And really that's what people are saying, what must I do to be saved? You know, and I thank God for that uh, because without the preaching of the gospel, there is no salvation because there's nothing can satisfy a man or a woman. There's an emptiness on the inside of every person. There's a little vacuum on the inside that all the alcohol cannot uh, fulfill that emptiness. All the drugs, all the illicit sex cannot fulfill that emptiness there. It's only the spirit of the living God that can really fulfill and give man peace and give him fulfillment. And it all comes by the spirit. That's why the old, the old prophet, he said, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit saith the Lord. So I want you to know that there's something great and wonderful in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's nothing that can compare to this moment in the life of a saint. It's the day that God moves in. Now, for me and my wife, when we got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time, I, I met people later that were saved that didn't have the Holy Spirit. And I said, well, you're not saved. And so I had real ignorance of the scripture. But you know what? Being baptized in the Holy Spirit is not the finish line. It's just actually the starting line. And uh, so I'm, I remember when we got saved, it was like, like God catapulted us out of the starting gate like you know, on fire. And uh, this is not a matter of salvation because you can be saved and yet not filled. I learned later. Uh, in Acts chapter eight, we do read this, and it's, it's really important to understand this. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. They came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So they were saved, but they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, we need to understand this. The Holy Spirit is the igniter of your salvation, and we can't deny that. And so he actually changes you on the inside but we need something subsequent to that. He said, for they had not yet fallen, uh, the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus as his possession. I love that, as his possession. And listen to what Paul says. He says, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of, about God, for I resolved to know nothing uh, while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and and with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were, were, were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Then in Acts chapter one, verse eight, I love this, but it, I'm gonna share something maybe a little deeper in a second. He says, you will receive power, the dynamite, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This, uh, this power is actually translated from the Greek as dudamus, which actually is the word dynamite. And uh, so we have it in our English Bibles just as power, but it's the dynamite of God. It's the power of his presence to change a person from a Saul to a Paul or, you know, whoever you are today listening to this is, is powerful what he can do in your life. So if you desire to be baptized, you need to ask. Jesus said this, he says in John, in the book of John, he says, you know, uh, you fathers who are evil, you know, when your son or your daughter asks for a loaf of bread, do you give him a snake or a scorpion? It, it, it's deeper than that. But he says, how much more will the Father give to, to the Holy Spirit to them who ask? See, we just need to ask. I know there's so many people who want more and they're believing for more. I'll tell you, the more that you're missing is the Holy Spirit. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Uh, Debbie and I are privileged to travel down the road in the Ministry of Canada's Double Portion. It's a, a five-piece band. We travel all over Canada and the U.S. with our family. Uh, we're blessed with 10 children. And when we got married, I wanted four and she wanted six. <laughs> and so we did. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so God has been very faithful to us. It's been 35 years that we've been in ministry and we've learned that God is not so much looking for our ability as he is our availability. Mm -hmm. And we are not the most talented, not the most gifted, but we have made ourselves available to the Lord. And we have said, like Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. Mm -hmm. I grew up with my dad ministering on the First Nation Reserves and uh, seeing God move and work and feeling the call of God on my life for ministry. And that's where the band started with my three sisters and myself and Double Portion came from. And uh, God was also working on Debbie's heart and was calling her at a young age. Yeah, actually, as a teenager, I uh, taught Vacation Bible School in a lot of the northern communities 
in Saskatchewan uh, as a team we'd go and uh, teach the children about the Lord and um, that's where I was kind of grounded in the Word of God and uh, where I learned how to play guitar leading the songs uh, we would meet in the halls or in uh, the schools and um, travel through the summer and it was a really great opportunity for me I met Duncan's sister uh, through that. She was teaching as well, and then I met Duncan. Double portion came to town. <laughs> we actually got to talk. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> you know, their group came to our community as well, and um, that's where we started our relationship and got married. I joined the group, and I didn't play an instrument on stage at the time, but uh, later on, when I was 28, and we couldn't keep a piano player consistent in the group, I uh, learned how to play, and that's kind of where, I, where I'm at right now, just, um, I'm not real proficient, but I just give the Lord my uh, abilities and he's, uh, he's just far exceeded anything we could ever think. Yeah, God certainly has taught us that when he has our availability that, and we prove our dependability, that he increases our capabilities. And I like to say it myself, uh, when we are faithful, he makes us fruitful. And uh, God certainly has been faithful. That has nothing to do with our name, double portion, or 10 kids or anything like that. <laughs> you know, all of us in our life have circumstances where we wonder if we should continue on. And we've actually had people tell us, you should just come home, cancel the tour, come home, and just you get a message from God. And it wasn't a message from God. <laughs> uh, but we kept pressing on, pressing on. And when we were coming back from those tours and we were crossing the border, we thought about all the things that God has done and all the people that he had touched and ministered to. Yes. And we realized that we just needed to be dependable. We needed to go forward and be faithful and God would be faithful. And so he has increased our capabilities, the capacity for ministry, the opportunities for ministry. And God has certainly uh, exceeded beyond what we thought he would do. That's or right. we could imagine. Mm -hmm. I long for Saskatchewan to see an outpouring of God's Spirit that will make a difference, not in the excitement of our church services, but, but in our sons and our daughters, our next door neighbors coming to Christ. And when I preach that sort of stuff, I, I, I get this, yes, pastor, yes, pastor, amen, pastor, coming from the congregation. But I find for the most part, we tend to be enthusiasts. At least that's the word John Wesley used. Having this tendency to get really excited about things. We're enthusiastic. And then we realize there's a price to pay. And we're not willing to pay the price. There's a price to pay in Saskatchewan for us to see a move of God. I love the book of Joel. A number of years ago, I was reading through it and I noticed a repetition of three things. Joel chapter one, verse 14. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land of the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. I miss the days when the saints used to come into the house of the Lord and, and really, really cry out to the Lord. Chapter two and, and verse number 12. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Friends, the church of Jesus Christ in our land needs to return to God with all of our heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. In verse number 15, so this is a threefold call in the book of Joel. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. We've got to assemble. We've got to get together in the house of the Lord. The people of God need to get together and cry out to God for God to move. And then we get to the promise. We get to the promise. This does not happen if we're enthusiasts. We get to the promise, Joel chapter two and verse 28. It'll come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. When are we going to see this outpouring of God's spirit on all mankind? It'll come about after this, after what? after there's been this coming together of the people of God to cry out to God, to fast, to say, oh God, we need you. We need a fresh, powerful outpouring of your spirit in our land, in our province, in our city, in our town. I challenge us, my friends. I challenge us province of Saskatchewan. I challenge us churches of Saskatchewan. Ask God, go to God as churches and congregations. Let's gather together. Let's cry out to the Lord and ask for an outpouring of God's spirit on our great, wonderful province of Saskatchewan. and grass.
gravel roads Saskatchewan is my home I need a place for time and space But just leave well alone But this thing that they call progress It sure comes with a lot of pain And it's time for all God's children To be calling on his name This is God's country And this is our time To take the light of the world into a dark place And let that little light shine If you want to speak out, let your actions do the talking If you need a plan, then get on your knees You want to make a difference in this land Well then you've got to be the change Sunsets, eternal skies, families built to last. I hope that's moving forward, not only in our past. A lot more than a lot to lose, you gotta hold with all your might. I know in the end that the good guys win, but not without a fight. Cause this is God's country, and this is our time. To take the light of the world into a dark place, and let that little light shine. Speak out, let your actions do the talking. If you need a plan, then get on your knees. You want to make a difference in this land, well, then you've got to be the change. It's going to take faith, hope, and a lot of love. It's going to take faith, hope, and a lot of love. It's going to take faith, hope, and a whole lot of love. It's going to take faith. Hope and a whole lot of love This is God's country And this is our time To take the light of the world into a dark place And let that little light shine And if you want to speak out, let the actions do the talking If you need a plan, then get on your knees You want to make a difference in this land Well then you gotta be, you gotta be, you gotta be the change